Can I get a mic or a mic in the hair? That source owe me. Shout out to the editor's staff. Yeah, I'm all grown so much better with math. I need a spread in the force, taking the Benjamin Bath. Yeah, I'm serving this track like Steph Graff. Yeah, Roger Federer, there's no competitor. Urban Tennis, episode 16, In the Heat of the Night. Welcome back, everyone, to the Urban Tennis Podcast. I'm your host, joined by my co-host. How do you do? Pretty good. On this week's podcast, we're going to be previewing all things Australian Open, uh, looking over the men's draw, the women's draw, some of the coaching changes that happened in the latter part of 2013 and how they impact the Australian Open, and recalling some fond memories of what we have of the Happy Slam. So if you're all ready, here's episode 16 of the podcast. Okay, looking over the men's draw, what I initially noticed was it's fairly lopsided towards the top half. You have Nadal drawn with Murray, with Federer, with Del Potro, uh, with Songa. And on the bottom half, you have Djokovic, and his challengers are Ferrer, Burdick, uh, and Wawrinka. So let's look at a closer take, quarter by quarter, and more of the more, of the more intriguing storylines um, with every section. Okay, so starting off with Nadal's section... Um, right away, the Australian media gasped when they saw Bernard Tomic drawn against Rafael Nadal. Um, something that obviously everybody wants to avoid. Tomic is showing pretty good form once again in January. But is there anything potentially you see in Nadal's first week draw that you're overly concerned with? Yeah, I think, uh, just in general, he's gonna have to, he's gonna have to face a tougher competition than, uh, the other quarters are he's gonna he's gonna have to be the he might have to go four maybe even five sets in in the first week and that's gonna be tough uh, in his later weeks. Yeah, I, I think there's really nobody that could really knock him off in the first four rounds, but like potentially Tomic could take a round off him. Nishikori is there; he can take a round off him. It's not the easiest path, not something like what well, we'll talk about. Andy Murray gets, but um, it's gonna be. Difficult, but obviously manageable. Uh, Nadal returning to Melbourne for the first time since 2012. So that, once again, getting used to the courts again, that could be something else. Something else I saw in this quarter that I jumped out at me uh, for Canadian fans, uh, Milos Raonic potentially facing a fourth-round draw against Juan Martin Del Potro. Probably the worst draw he can get. Um, how do you see Raonic's tournament taking shape? Yeah, for the reasons you mentioned, I'm not too confident. I mean, I'm really, really hope it happens, but yeah, he's gonna have, he's a tough path to even get to the fourth round. And the fourth round, he's potentially facing Del Potro. And then even if he beats Del Potro, probably gonna face Nadal. So, uh, it's not what we want, especially, uh, hardcore is a, is a surface that does serve, does surface the type of game that he does play. And especially if he doesn't make it out, it's just going to get further credence to the people who say, why should we believe in Raonic when he cannot pass the fourth round? But once again, you know, he could have gotten drawn with Warinka, with Burdick, and you would have looked more optimistic in his hopes. But Del Potro is playing really well. And, you know, Del Potro could be one of the people that actually comes out of here. Okay, so let's pick somebody coming out of this quarter. Who do you think comes out of this quarter? Nadal. Yeah, I'm going to go with Nadal too. Okay, next uh, on Nadal's side is Murray's quarter. Um, Andy Murray's in it. Sangha's in it. Federer's in it. Andy Murray's only played two matches since his back surgery. A lot of people saying that he does not look great. Um, he's talked about how he's got to get comfortable with himself. Um, are you worried about Andy Murray in this tournament? And is he still a threat to you, a title threat in any way? Yeah, I would I would be worried about Andy Murray, but I don't think he'd be a top top contender like uh, he's, i don't think he'd want to be one of my top three picks for this tournament yet because uh he is coming off uh an injury that was worse than he expected i mean uh, i think some people were expecting he'd be back by uh the atp world tour final but he wasn't so i think it shows that he still has some things to work on in his game if he did take <laughs> that extra time off to come back in january well i think the one advantage murray does have is his first three matches are going to be really easy he's not going to face anybody in the top 100 He's got Goso Eda of Japan. He's got a qualifier. And then probably somebody else outside the top 100 in round three. That's an advantage. I think Murray's going to get stronger as the weeks go. Uh, so if he can f- somehow find his way 
into a quarterfinal matchup against a Songa or Federer relatively healthy, that, that could be something he would hopefully look forward to. But obviously Murray's weakness, I think a sleeper in this quarter may be Marin Chilik, who's coming off a long suspension, but has a lot of talent. <clears throat> so let's talk about Federer. Um, once again, he's changed his racket, sticking with a bigger racket this time. Looked pretty good in Brisbane. Um, but he's got a potential fourth round matchup against Joe Wilfried Songa, who does really well against him, at least in re- um, recent years in Grand Slams. What do you think Federer's chances are uh, in this quarter? Um, I think they're okay. I mean, it's not the most competitive quarter. It's not like Nadal's quarter where there's a it's very lopsided on talented talented players who are may or may not be seated. Uh, but it's always tough with Federer. It just depends on. Uh, how he's going to come in. How, like, how much has, has these changes he's going to make really affect his game? Is it going to take time for him to get used to it? Is it going to take, uh, a few weeks or is, uh, or is he going to come in really strong? I mean, let's not forget, it's still Roger Federer. As much as people don't think he has anything left, it's Roger Federer. That, I think that's enough said. That's true. On his best day, he's a top four talent, but he's having some of those off days and where he can get, get by anybody essentially. So picks for this quarter, I'm actually going to go with Roger Federer. I think Andy Murray showing a little weakness. I'm going to go Roger Federer. Well, I'm going to go with John Isner. I, we, <laughs> okay, I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding about that one. I, I just feel like we needed to mention the top-ranked American, and I think he can upset a few players in this quarter. But I'm still going to go with Andy Murray in this quarter. Okay, next quarter is the wild card quarter, uh, obviously because David Ferrer is in it. Ferrer is a very consistent top-five player, but puts fear in nobody's eyes. He's drawn with Burdick. Uh, Tommy Haas is a nice sleeper in this draw. Um, I'm gonna. I'm looking at Tommy Haas. I think if he really plays his best, he's got a good shot of beating Burdick and then facing a Ferrer. I kind of like him in this draw. Well, yeah, it just depends. Ferrer is a, for the last couple of years. This thing has been he plays really, really well in Grand Slams, but then he plays average in uh, the rest of the tournaments, whether it be a Masters event, whether it be a 500 series event, he doesn't play as well as he does in Grand Slams. So it just depends on how well he plays in Grand Slams is going to really determine how this draw goes. And and Tomas Burdek has been pretty inconsistent for me. He, you know, he's he's such a consistently, you know, top eight kind of guy, but he hasn't really taken a next step. So you really don't know what you're going to get. He could be a third round and out. He could be a semifinal threat. So that's going to be something I'm going to be assessing early on if Tomas Burdick is on top form. Um, so who's your pick to come out? I'm actually going to go with, uh, yeah, I'm going to go David Ferrer. I think this draw, everybody thinks it's going to break some way, but I think it'll probably break his way. Yeah, I'm going to say Ferrer too for the same reasons. Okay. Uh, the final quarter led by the three-time defending champion Novak Djokovic. First, to start up, winning four in a row in Australia would be the most in the open era. It would basically have a control of a court similar to what Nadal has had in in Paris, similar to what uh, Federer had in New York and in London. So how close are we to uh, ordaining Novak Djokovic as the best player in Australian Open history? I think very close. I personally, I think Novak is my favorite to win this tournament. Uh, sorry for spoiling that for anybody waiting for this podcast. Uh, it just, he seems like he brings out the best tennis every year in January. It's like, it's tough for anybody else to be with him. I, I mean, Nadal did it last year, but then Nadal probably had, or no, was it last year or 2012? 20, 2012 was yeah, it. Yeah, 2012, my mistake. Yeah, but that was that was more the exception to the rule where people were really sold on Nadal and hardcore. I think this year people are a lot more sold on Nadal and hardcore, especially after the ending at last year. So I think uh, Novak will still be in the final, especially if this quarter is not the most difficult for him. And especially if he does face somebody like Derek, David Ferrer, who he really has had his number. Exactly. Uh, other names in this quarter, Stan Wawrinka, who had a great match with Djokovic last year. Uh, Ernest Galbis may make a deep threat for Canadians. Vasek Pospisil. Anybody else catch your eye? I think we need to mention Vasek Pospisil twice. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, who's your pick in this quarter? I'm going to go with Novak, of course. Yep, Novak for me too. Okay, I think we're moving on to the ladies' draw. Moving on to the women's side, we have Victoria Azarenka re- returning as a defending champion. 
But let's run through the draw for this one, too. And starting with Serena's section, we have a lot of interesting names in this section. And of course, we have the hometown girl, Sam Stozer, coming in at uh, number 17. And then we also have Anna Ivanovic, who had a really strong, really strong uh, play to end off last year. And uh, the return, the return of Vera Zvonareva. Uh, I think I pronounced that right. It's a bit of a tongue twister. But yeah, as you know, a former world number three, I believe, uh, really coming back uh, onto the WTA Tour. And uh, we'll see how well she does in the Australian Open. Uh, it's not the easiest quarter to be drawn into, especially if you, even if you go deep, you probably have to face Serena Williams pretty soon. Uh, so uh, let's see. And uh, of course, other notable names I almost missed. Jeannie Bouchard is in this draw. Got to gotta pop up for those Canadians. Just as a note, we have three seated Canadians this time in the tournament, and my co-host really wants to get in here, so I'm going to let him talk right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> anytime Serena's in your section, she's going to overshadow everything. But um, like you were saying, Stowe's are against Zach Lipova. They just faced um, this past week. Uh, Aussies are definitely going to be paying attention to that. Stowe's has struggled tons and tons in Australia. And you just kind of feel for her. Um, Sarah Ronnie's in the section. She's somebody that people love to see in a section because they think they can beat her. So if you're a fan of Jeannie Bouchard, a potential third-round matchup there, maybe a chance to win. You never know after that. Uh, but obviously I think uh, my co-host is going to pick uh, Serena Williams, I think, will definitely come out of this draw. Yeah, but I, as always, yeah, got to hope Jeannie Bouchard somehow does it. But yeah, Serena Williams is going to win this draw. Okay, the next section. Um, I think this is the loaded section. You have names like Lina, Sabine Lazicki, Petra Kvitova, Angelique Kerber. Um, who of those four uh, intrigues you the most? Um, and who is somebody you think can really pose a challenge deep into this tournament? I'm going to say Kvitova. Uh, Kvitova has gone a little bit quieter over the last few months. So I really think uh, a tournament like Australia, especially where she's going to face... Uh, Get a, t- get a chance to get through a lot of her competition early on, which on one hand it could tire her out early, but on the other hand it, me- it leaves her path clearer after this quarter. I think you're almost speaking to all the tennis faithful. We just always wait for Petra Kvitova. She has so much, so much talent. Being a left-hander, she poses so many threats to so many players, but she's maddingly inconsistent. But when Petra Kvitova clicks in a tournament, it's a sight to see. So. But I think Lina, uh, defending finalist here last year, uh, obviously plays well. Two-time finalist here. Uh, and now at 32, this may be one of her last shots, so I hope she does well. And I think Angelique Kerber, once again, another lefty um, who plays really well. She's got potential here. Uh, just looking it over quickly, Katarina Makarova versus Venus Williams. That'll be an interesting first-round matchup. Uh, both players have a lot of you know game and Venus... Uh, at this age, you never know what to expect, but I think that should be a great match. Uh, who do you think is coming out of this quarter? I'm going to go with Kvitova. I think this is a, this is a year she finally breaks through and makes it to the semifinal. I'm going to go Angelique Kerber. Um, nothing really separates her from anybody else, but I feel that maybe she comes out here. Okay, the next one. Uh, the next draw, led by Maria Sharapova, uh, who's coming back after her own shoulder injury. Or not, Andy Murray had a back injury, but shoulder injury. Uh, so Sharapova's back, but does it really matter for this tournament? Do you think she's going to be a factor in Melbourne? Well, she has played stronger for the warm-ups for this. I mean, she did make the finals in uh, Sydney, I believe, or Brisbane, one of those two. And uh, she won, but then again, she had to face Serena Williams, the player she can never beat. I think another... Semi-finals, she made semi-finals. Semi-finals, okay, my mistake. Uh, yes, but I think the more interesting part is, uh, is seeing how highly ranked Jelena Jankovic is in, this, is in the quarter, which, uh, shouldn't have come as a surprise if we were watching the second half of last year, but still to see Jelena Jankovic back at number eight, that's a really good sight to see. Uh, definitely. Jankovic is a threat in this section. Uh, but so is Simona Halep, who's ranked 11. If you thought Yankovic came on, Simona Halep came on absolutely in 2013, winning six times, but was really never a factor in a Grand Slam. So she's this is the only second time she's seeded in a Grand Slam. So seeded at 11. We'll see if uh, she really is somebody who just 
shines on the lesser tournaments or if she can kind of put together a couple of wins because like we've been saying, we know Sharapova did well in her pre-tournament, but she may be ready for the taking here. So uh, I'm going to turn over my co-host. Who do you think comes out of this quarter? Yeah, this is probably the most wide open quarter, I think. So yeah, I think I'll go with Simona Halep too. I mean, uh, I think this is a time. I co-host convinced me that she could break through. <laughs> Simona Halep, I, I think I'm gonna go with uh I'm gonna go Yelena Yankovic. My co host convinced me. <laughs> uh but obviously Maria Sharapova, if she's playing well, she is obviously a threat here. Uh the final quarter led up by the two time defending champion Victoria Azarenka. Just thinking hypothetically, if she does win her third straight, what does this mean for Victoria Azarenka as a player? Should we be considering her as a you know, an all time great? Uh, fortunate to do it in Melbourne. What would a third straight title mean to her legacy? I think it would really, really, I mean, this is a cliche, but it would cement her legacy. I mean, a lot of times, 95% of the discussion about Azarenka is about, I think we mentioned this in our previous podcast, is about how big of a villain she is. But I think winning three straight and a chance to win three straight, that's really flown under the radar. Especially after the Australian Open last year. The rest of the year, except for Wimbledon, all we heard about was Serena Williams, Serena Williams, Serena Williams. How even at 31, she was having a, one of the best years of her, of her career. But we have seen in years before that, Azarenka is the one most likely to beat Serena Williams out of any, any player on the WTA right now. Yeah, I think if she does win three in a row... First, they'll seem very odd because, you know, she doesn't really seem at this current point projecting as somebody who's, you know, considered as somebody who can be year in, year out contending for that title. But when you take a step back and reflect on it, she'd have shown a lot of just absolute talent on hard courts. And, you know, she puts herself once again, makes the rivalry a bit more legitimate with Serena. It makes her case as being the second best player on tour. Somebody who, when Serena does retire, somebody who can maybe pile on three or four slams. So it's, I think, definitely a legacy slam for Azarenka if she does win. Uh, another intriguing name in this quarter is Sloane Stevens, who uh, gobbled up all the, all the headlines last year with her surprise run to the semifinals. This time, potentially seeing Azarenka the fourth round, the heavy pressure of trying to repeat what she did in Australia. What do you make of uh, Azarenka? No, sorry, Sloane Stevens this year. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of creating interest in the U.S. for tennis, I hope Sloane Stevens does well. In fact, I even hope she goes to the final and faces Serena Williams. Like, whatever, that'd be awesome for in terms of how much excitement it would create. Yeah, she definitely has a lot of you know name cachet now. Um, her playing style, just that intrigue with Serena. If she does advance in the tournament, I think it's good for North American audiences. Um, because she definitely tries to put on a show, whether it be on or off the court. Uh, so who do you like in this quarter? I'm going to stick with the defending champion, Victoria Azarenka. Ditto. Okay. Uh, we'll look more into doubles and mixed doubles later on, but uh, there's some surprising names playing doubles, so if you check out AustrianOpen.com, you can read that. Uh, moving forward, we have a lot of changes happen on the coaching ranks at the end of the year. And their first big impact will be seen at the Australian Open. So of the three significant changes uh, to the top of the men's side, so Boris Becker coming on with Djokovic, uh, Stefan Edberg joining the coaching team for Roger Federer, and Michael Chang helping out Kini Shikori, who makes the most immediate impact uh, and why? I'm going to go with Stefan Edberg uh, pairing up with Roger Federer. I think because Roger Federer has the most changes to make in his game. That may sound weird because he is the oldest, most experienced, of course, on the tour with the most wins. But he's coming off uh, about six, seven months where he didn't have a coach at all, I think. And he's also changing to a larger racket size. So that's a, that, that's two big changes in how he trains and prepares for, for tournaments. And I think that's going to be the biggest impact that Edberg can make. Yeah, I think it's easy to go with uh, like somebody like Michael Chang helping Nishikori because Nishikori has the most to gain. But I think I'm going to stick with um, Stefan Edberg too. Just the fact that he's kind of very, very, not kind of, he is absolutely similar to what Roger Federer is on the court. Level-headed demeanor. He's not going to do much. You know, there you really can't teach a 17-time champion to do anything. I think it'll be more of a calming influence 
than more than anything else. And I really don't know what to feel about the Boris Becker relationship with Djokovic. That to me will seem to be something that I need to see um, come true. If you live on the North American East Coast, you're used to late nights and early mornings while watching the Australian Open. So we're going to share some of our more humorous stories of trying to watch the Australian Open. Well, I, I know personally that I've set my alarm at 3 a.m. while others are sleeping, um, snuck downstairs to my big HD screen, um, a pot of coffee, a pot of milk, and, you know, on a cold winter night, snuggled up and watched that hypnotic blue cord. But I think I'd do it again, and I'll probably do it again this year because it's just such a rewarding experience. You know, you, it's not easy to come by. You kind of feel like you earned it when you're watching the Australian Open. So it's something that I feel is often rewarding despite the effort it takes. Yeah, and I even remember waking up, trying to catch some tennis while eating breakfast, and then while heading out, like 7 a.m., I remember when I was like Djokovic or Alrinka a couple years back, like trying to li- trying to listen to every single update on my way to school for that 8 a.m. class, trying to see like, oh, how's this match going to end. So if you get the chance, definitely wake up early uh, and watch some Australian Open tennis these next two weeks. Uh, we're nearing the end of this episode of the Urban Tennis Podcast, but like always, we like to end with some games. So our first game is a game of challenges, where we have three challenges for the different worlds of tennis uh, this week week in the Australian Open. And I'll start off. My first challenge is to Ryan Harrison. I know he's got a lot of defenders who defend the fact that he's always faced difficult draws in Grand Slams, and that's the reason why he hasn't won anything. This week, he'll face Gil Monfils. Definitely a tough draw, and he'll probably lose. But, folks, Ryan Harrison should be playing better in other parts of the year so he can avoid these draws, okay? If he plays better, if he improves his ranking, eventually he's going to stop playing these guys. So it's all up to Ryan Harrison to put up or shut up. And my second challenge this year is to the Australian Open organizers. The weather forecast is extremely hot, so please take caution, all right? The safety of the players and the safety of the fans is important. If you need to take longer timeouts, play these matches under the two roofs, I'm all for it, okay? Sure, it's an outdoor slam, but if you need to make it indoor because of extreme heat, I'm fine with that. All right, and my challenge goes out to myself. Uh, I did have stories of uh, waking up and watching the show and open, but I have had trouble in the past. I'm going to make sure to watch as much tennis as possible during this first week of the Australian Open. Okay, and now our social media highlight of the week. And since we're in Australia, I thought we'd pick up on an Aussie girl, Sam Stozer. You know... Tennis, like any other sport, sometimes relies on cliches uh, for headlines. So one of the headlines in a local paper was Sam Sozer on a roll. She went to her social media sites, took a picture of her literally resting her head on a dinner roll. So Sam Sozer literally on a dinner roll. That's our social media highlight of the week. Uh, As always, you can listen to the Urban Tennis Podcast on SoundCloud, YouTube, and BackRowSports.com. We'll be back next week uh, in the middle of the Australian Open, recapping what we've seen and try to project what will we see. Um, so thank you for listening. Episode 16, In the Heat of the Night. Don't.